Good evening. Um, I'm Councillor Chris Colwick, uh, uh, Chair of Planning Committee. Uh, so welcome to this um, meeting of the City of York Council Planning Committee on the 13th of June 2019. This meeting will be webcast so that it can be uh, watched live by the residents of, of York or of course at, at any time in the future. Uh, let me reassure you that if you're sitting in the public area, you're not in front of the camera, but of course uh, if you are here to speak, uh, then you will be picked up on the webcam. Um, I do have uh, two apologies, uh, apologies both from Councillor Widdowson and from Councillor Perrett. Councillor Widdowson is being substituted by Councillor Fisher, but I was waiting for a moment because uh, he's not here at the moment, I'm sure he will appear. Uh, and Councillor Perrett is um, substituted by Councillor Webb, uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, you know the drill, of course, if you have a mobile phone, please switch it off or switch it to silent, that would be appreciated. Um, there is no emergency or fire alarm uh, scheduled for this evening, so uh, should there be some emergency, we will uh, treat it uh, as, as we should do, so please uh, be prepared to, to leave in that event. Um, we'll be using the, the main stairs and out through the front entrance. Uh, also, um, toilets, just in case you need to access those through the door behind me here, which also prompts me to say that if at any point in the meeting uh, you, you leave, and it may be that you've come as a public speaker, it doesn't mean you've got to stay right through to the bitter end of the meeting. Uh, do leave by this door, though, otherwise if you go through the back door, you may never be seen again. Um, the uh, declarations of interest. I invite all members of the committee to inform me and the committee of any interests. I've got two who are indicating. Councillor Eyre. Uh, in respect of 4B, Chair, uh, personal, I believe, non-prejudicial interest in terms of the fact that through my employment with Health Watch North Yorkshire, I do work quite often with Leah and Community First Yorkshire, but I don't believe it's prejudicial. And Councillor Douglas. Um, it's about 4B as well, non-prejudicial interest that uh, Community First Yorkshire, both of the charities that I'm chair of, use them as a service provider. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning those. Um, there are, this evening, uh, two speakers who've registered. Uh, under the uh, general remit of the committee, not speaking to specific items on the plans list, um, and of course not speaking to any particular uh, planning application, but wanting to make some general comments. Uh, you, are, you know the drill, you have three minutes uh, to address the committee. I'll just give you a 30 second uh, uh, warning, as it were, when we get to two and a half minutes. But Mr. Hamill, if you want to take the seat there, and you'll need to press the microphone button in front of you. The planning system is a monopoly, as we all know. Um, I have to use, and others all have to use, York Council planning system. We can't go anywhere else. So therefore, as a monopolistic public service, shouldn't it be run fairly and efficiently? The chart before you illustrates the progress of my current planning applications in York. Uh, previous applications for the Black House, which I know you, Chair, have actually seen, took seven months to finalise uh, after a planning condition, to, to alter a planning condition. And Fulford Road, which is another scheme I'm involved in, which is for three houses and six flats, took five months to approve just simply the pre-start conditions. Uh, I know of other developers who are facing equally long delays in getting simple applications both verified and resolved. For example, there is the so-called uh, consultation period where consultees reply often long after the deadlines that have been set, but their thoughts are taken as valid enough to delay the decision even longer. And in, I know of a case where the flood team uh, replied a month after the target date, then decided to send out their own consultations 
uh, to others before reporting. Now, this was back in April, and we're still in mid-June waiting for a decision. And this is for a lump of earth in a back garden that's obviously is, is, is classed as an engineering operation, so it requires planning consent. Um, then there's a the delegated decision process. Uh, I applied to put solar panels on the rear roof slopes of the Black House in February. The target date was then extended to May, and after lots of chasing, I was told last week that they'd been lost in administration. The officer concerned had previously advised me that he had recommended the application for approval and was just waiting to have it signed off, so I wasn't too worried. However, last week I heard that they changed their minds and were going to refuse the application. Uh, remember that this is for solar panels, which can be seen all over York, uh, yet it takes the planning department five months to consider and then refuse. So here we go, another appeal with time and costs. The situation is not, is not very good, uh, not just for the delays, but which cost jobs, but also the cost to both of the applicants like me, who appeal every refusal, and the cost of the council, who then have to allocate staff time and money to defend the appeals. So you can do two simple things to reverse this utter waste. You've got 30 seconds. Thank you. I'm nearly there. Have a meeting with regular applicants so that you, can, you, the committee, can hear our problems directly, and then, if you decide, you can do something about it. And secondly, allow applicants who are advised that their application is to be refused, give them the option to have the decision brought to your committee. Uh, your officers, though well-meaning, don't always get it right. And before an application is refused, you, the elected members, should be allowed to hear both sides of the argument, then make an informed democratic decision. Thank you. Two, two seconds. Uh, be very quick. Be very quick. Can I ask, I, I know you're, you're going to thank me for my contribution and my point, points will be taken into consideration. <laughs> can I ask that this is the start of a proper dialogue between us and you, so you hear directly what the issues are? <laughs> thank you. I'm happy to answer Thanks, questions. Thanks, Mr. Hamill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No questions. Thanks. And Ms. Labrack, again, three minutes. Okay. The planning system is supposed to be fair and consistent, but here in York we have the dystopian George Orwell version, where all applicants are equal, but some applicants are more equal than others. Let me explain. If you are the directors of Taxpayer Subsidised Spark, you can come to this room and give categoric assurances about your development, but then renege on those promises and lie to the press denying that there were ever any commitments in the first place and no sanctions will be imposed against you. If you are the social organisation Joseph Browntree Housing Trust with permission to build homes subject to important requirements, your contractors on site can implement unauthorised changes and ignore conditions and nothing of any significance will be done to you. But if you are a hard-working, self-employed citizen risking your own money regenerating the city with high quality developments, providing jobs and increasing the housing stock, then you can expect very different treatments. If you need to take down and rebuild a structurally unsafe wall, you can expect local councillors to immediately take the side of hostile neighbours and go to the press with a story about deplorable wrongdoing by private developers. That article will contain vindictive demands for fines against you and a stop notice even though you have already halted, pending a fresh application to complete the works exactly as originally approved. Furthermore, you can expect this to happen without those councillors having the common decency to contact you first to hear your side of the story or to ascertain the full facts before they rush to the local newspaper with their character assassination of you. This is a clear manifestation of bias and prejudice in the planning system. Publicly funded bodies are treated differently to private enterprise individuals. This is wrong. It is reprehensible and damaging to the reputation of the local planning authority. Those councillors responsible for these double standards might like to show they can be gentlemen by offering an unreserved apology to the applicants they have wrongly maligned. That is all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Lavrak.
Thank you both. Thank you for your comments of a general nature, of course not relating to any applications that are before us this evening. Um, I understand that there are other opportunities um, to make um, to en enter into to dialogue, and I understand there's another agents forum scheduled fairly soon. So no doubt some of these things will be taken up then. But thank you both very much. Thank you. I didn't um, pick up on the minutes of the previous uh, meeting, but I'm going to do that now. Um, there are a number of us who were at the last meeting of the planning committee. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll remember we were there looking at the uh, York Central uh, outline. Are you content for me to sign in due course the minutes we have of that last meeting of the committee? I take that as a yes. Thank you. I'll sign later. Oh, of course. And for the March meeting, the previous meeting, you also have the minutes of that meeting, and we need to sign those off. Thank you very much. And so we will move on to the items we have on tonight's agenda, three uh, applications, and we're going to take those in order. Uh, so the first of those is the Vale Engineering application, and we begin with an office update. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Right, the application before you um, this afternoon is um, an application for a new building at Vale Engineering. Um, the site is in the green belt. Um, there's a couple of photos here, so the building itself will sit right where these vehicles and machinery are now. And here you see this is the site um, from the highway, from the access road. Um, site of, as I've said, it's in the green belt. There's a good boundary treatment. It's very enclosed as a site. The buildings were originally um, constructed for a pig farm, so they were originally agricultural buildings, um, but they're now in a B1 use um, for Vale Engineering, who I understand produce machinery um, for weed control and winter maintenance, um, which we saw when we went on site on Tuesday. So the proposed building... I'll just flick back, um, goes up here in the top northeast corner of the site. Um, it will be agricultural in appearance. We have plans there of it. Um, it's no taller than the existing buildings, so all those we saw on the site plan, it is really quite a large building and will extend over most of that side boundary of the site in conjunction with the buildings already there. Um, it is to provide cover for works that are currently undertaken at site, but there's no space in the existing building, so I currently understand workers work outside at some times of the year. Um, the proposal will result in three new staff being employed. Thank you much, very much. Do members have any questions they want to put? No. Okay, in that case, uh, I invite Mark Newby to speak, who I understand is uh, agent for the applicant and will be speaking in support of the application. As you've seen how this works, uh, three minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, in support of the officer's recommendation, uh, we'd ask you to consider the following points. Vale Engineering, an existing local employer who has operated from the site for a number of years in the assembly, maintenance and storage of weed control and gritter equipment. The building is required to provide cover for the company's workforce, which currently takes place in the open. Turning to the planning merits. In terms of the green belt, the proposal constitutes inappropriate development in accordance with the NPPF, which by definition is harmful to the green belt and can only be approved in very special circumstances, which are, the building is required to be of a scale necessary for the production of the, of the business and, and the height is required to, uh, to lift gritter bodies onto axles. A lack of space in the existing buildings requires assembly to take place outside to the detriment of the welfare of the workforce in the cold of the winter and the heat of the summer. Alternative sites at Northminster Business Park have been considered. However, this would require the workforce, a fragmentation of the workforce and require the doubling up of tools and equipment to cover both sites. In addition, the business park is a 10 mile round trip through uh, neighboring villages. 
There are also benefits from the existing site as the goods vehicles delivering materials and collecting finished equipment generally use the A1 and the B1224, thereby uh, avoiding most residential areas. The character and form of the building is akin to an agricultural setting and the mature boundary treatment around the site provides good screening of the development. In terms of impact of openness, the building will have little impact due to its agricultural nature and its scale relative to other buildings. In terms of planning policy, the proposal is supported by policies in the 2005 and 2018 local plans and in particular policies RK, RWK01, RK, uh, RWK10 and, R, and policy RWK16 of the adopted Ruffeth and Napton neighbourhood plan. The Parish Council also support the application. In terms of flood risk and drainage, the proposal will not increase flood risk elsewhere and the disposal of surface water can be dealt with by an appropriate condition. In terms of landscape and visual impact, this will be minimal as the building is similar in height to existing buildings and is well screened by existing boundary treatments and the existing buildings be between the site and the B1224. In terms of impact on neighbouring amenity, there will be little impact on neighbouring dwellings as the building is some 300 metres away. An appropriate condition is proposed to control any noise that any machinery may produce within the building. In terms of parking and access, the proposal will not result in a significant increase in traffic. The site is close to Ruffworth and the applicant will, employ, will seek to employ the three additional workers that the proposal will generate from the local area. There is also a bus service along Weatherby Road which can be used by local workers from the local area. We submit, therefore, that the proposal satisfied the policies of the City of York Local Plan 2005 and the draft local plan of 2018, together with the Ruffeth and Napton Neighbourhood Plan uh, and advice in NPPA. In conclusion, we therefore submit that there are no other material planning considerations or, or reasons that would present, prevent approval of the application, and the way that we therefore commend the recommendation of approval by the planning officer as set out in the report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Newby. Thank you. Just a few seconds over, but that's... Sorry? That's Just a few seconds over. Oh, that All right, fine. OK, thank you. Um, are there any questions that members have? Uh, please go ahead. Councillor... Just as regards the boundary treatment and the boundary edge, is that within the ownership of the applicant? Uh, yes, I believe so. So would the applicant be amenable to a condition um, requiring its retention and its retention at a certain height for the lifetime of the development? I would expect so, yes. Yeah. OK, thanks. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. So we move into debate, and uh, we have a recommendation to approve this application. Councillor Waters. Well, that just leads directly to a question to officers then. Um, could we have a condition requiring retention of the boundary edge because it's so integral to the acceptability of the development for the lifetime of the development and at the same height that it's at at the moment? That seems amenable. I imagine members have no difficulty with that. Okay. Well, on, on that basis, I'd just like to uh, move it for approval okay. with that condition. In that case, I think we've already got a seconder, Councillor Webb. Thank you. Um, do we want to debate this further? <laughs> You'll be very kind to me. Uh, in that case, I'll ask for a vote. Those in favour of the, the uh, approval of this application, please indicate. I think that's... Uh, of course, with the additional condition as agreed a moment ago. Thank you very much. Can we move on to, move on to uh, agenda item 4B, page 59. Again, if we could have any update that uh, would be helpful. Thank you, Chair. There's no update with regard to this one, so I'll just quickly run members through the plans that you visited on Tuesday. You can see the closed building in here in relation to the existing buildings at the site. This is the, eleva the elevations of the proposed building, as you can see, single storey with large meeting room, staff area and toilet area there. That's it. That's it in terms of your... Um, Information for this one. Thank you, Chair. 
Any questions, members? Okay. Uh, we do have a speaker here, uh, Leah Swain, joint advocate in support, representing Community First Yorkshire, uh, and uh, it is that charity which will be taking the tenancy of the proposed building. Thank you. Thank you. Three minutes. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to say a few words about the application. Um, Community First Yorkshire is an independent charity. We support rural communities to have equitable access to services as their urban counterparts and in North Yorkshire we also support other voluntary sector organisations. In addition we run projects such as X Forces Support which provides health support and social activities for a thousand veterans over the age of 65. We've been at our offices in Ask and Bryan about nine years and we've really valued having a supportive landlord like Robert Pilcher. Um, it's unusual in that he understands that as a charity we're always reviewing our office requirements um, we grow and shrink in size depending on funding available as a charity and he's always been very flexible with us, um, including on our uh, lease clauses. At the moment we're very much in a period of growth. We've grown from 11 staff two years ago to 38 staff now and we've been cramming them in the office um, but we really need more meeting space. Um, we have been looking at alternative offices in York but turns out they're all too expensive for us um, and they're not in a rural location which as a rural community council is important to us. The extra space being proposed would give us the meeting room space we need as all our current meeting room space now holds desks. It would also give us a quiet working room as our current open plan space is really quite busy and noisy and with so much hot desking we sometimes need quiet places to work. Our staff are based from both the Ask and Bryan office or home based across North Yorkshire, but the majority of our core marketing, finance and administration staff all live in York. We're keen to hold on to those experienced employees, which is why we're exploring extra space at Ask and Bryan, rather than taking the alternative option of moving further into North Yorkshire, where we know we could get the extra space at a good price, but then we would lose our experienced York based staff who've indicated they wouldn't move with us. We'd really love to um, keep an understanding landlord as a charity. We'd like to maintain our York location as it's so helpful for working North, South and West Yorkshire. Um, but we do need to give our staff the right working environment for them to carry on their fantastic work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do members have any questions they want to put? Councillor Pavlovic. Thank you, Chair. What do you currently do at the moment um, when you um, have to have meetings? Um, and just one other supplementary question, but not relevant to that one, is um, how much car park space do you have and is there adequate on this site for a period of growth? Okay, so um, taking the first question, um, when we have large external meetings where we've got maybe 15 to 20 external partners coming together, we always try to rent community space in village halls because we provide a village hall support service, so it's about the circular economy. Um, the problem we have is that when we have staff in the office doing one-to-ones or needing quiet space, or where we have our internal working groups of staff, they literally have nowhere to go. Um, we do have a picnic bench outside that we we use but um, it's not always the best environment for a meeting and one-to-ones we could do with a confidential space so we wouldn't be bringing more staff on or more cars it's just giving our staff some space to actually do their jobs um, because it's becoming quite unbearable to work where we are um, because we, we just don't have the breakout space um, the we have um, one, uh, I should know the answer to the parking space off the top of my head we have one two three four five six seven eight eight parking spaces and they've created three additional spaces for us by moving some of the parking around um, but we don't intend to have any more staff than we currently have so we, we wouldn't be changing our staffing numbers or the number of cars that come on site any other questions i have just one brief question um, is the proximity to the agricultural college a significant factor here only in that they have a good cafe with good coffee. We don't actually, we are working with them on their volunteering opportunities. Um, so we have got that kind of link across around how do we get young people volunteering more and we do quite a lot of work there. Um, but, it, but it isn't a substantive point for us. 
We wouldn't <laughs> stop doing that if we looped. <laughs> no more questions. Yes. Councillor Fitzpatrick. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't be on the site visit. I was at a funeral. I just want to ask about the water drainage there, the, the um, thing there from Yorkshire Water. We're clear about that, that that will be drained. That will be okay. I'm really sorry. I know nothing okay. about drainage. Um, I, I assume it would be okay. Um, okay. It might be helpful just to have a yeah. comment on that, please. Page 67, 4.28. Um, it's in a low flood zone one, so there's a low risk of flooding. Um, there is no objections from Yorkshire Water, the drainage boards. Um, there is a slight concern raised by the flood risk management team, but it's considered that this can be covered by condition. So it's felt to be acceptable subject to conditions. Condition, yeah, sorry. Condition three, drainage details to be agreed. It's on there. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I take it there are no more questions, in which case, uh, thank you very much. That was very helpful. And we move into debate. Councillor Fenton. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, it was interesting on the site visit yesterday to see um, the proposed development site, and there is actually a, a concrete footprint already on the site. And um, Mr Pilcher, who showed us around, did explain that there had been a building there, but I think it, it some years since it, um, it had been taken down. It did seem to us to be a, a, a suitable location, and from what we've heard today, I think the very, very special circumstances required have been demonstrated, um, and I'd like to propose that um, the application be approved. Thank you very much. Do I have a seconder? I do. Councillor Pavlovic, thank you very much. Please do. <laughs> Having heard um, about the work that um, Community First do, I think retaining them in York and helping them to develop is something that the authority ought to be encouraging. Um, and, um, and therefore, you know, I very much support them and the work they do and, and wish them all the very best for their ongoing development. Thank you. Any other contributions to the debate? In that case, uh, I, I concur and um, I think I'm satisfied that special conditions uh, that have been articulated are, are um, satisfactory and sufficient in this instance, I'll be happy to support the application. Can we therefore put it to the vote? Please indicate if you would like to approve this application. Again, I think that's unanimous. Thank you very much. So we move on to item 4C, page 73 in our agenda, and this is an application relating to landline to the south of Elvington Airfield Network, uh, a somewhat larger application than the two we've considered already this evening, but uh, we'll begin again with any updates. I think there are some updates, uh, and then uh, if you introduce the application, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, there are updates, if members can just see your uh, information put forward. There is amended wording to condition 12, which, with regard to the vehicle charging points. There are also addition, an additional conditions with regard to ecology. The report specifically referred to the need for ecology conditions. However, they were accidentally missed off, so there are the ecology conditions required. So they just all there in your additional information for you. In terms of the proposals, the red line is the site 
of the application. Let me just say that. Yeah. This is the application site here, so you can just see the access road in here, car parking, and sorry, car parking there, and the new building in here. This that that shows the elevations of the proposed building there. You see, it's a two-storey, quite large building. This is just for members' reference. This is the allocation proposed and this is an aerial photograph of the site so as you can see it's just coming in here okay thank you chair thank you very much and uh, again i open this for questions if you want to ask questions of the officer again councillor waters and then pavlovic Standard one in relation to condition 15, uh, if the landscaping is so integral to the acceptability of the development, it should be there for the lifetime of the development, not just the five-year condition. Noted. Pavlovic. Councillor Pavlovic. Thank you, Colwick. Uh, <laughs> Can I ask you about the um, electric charging points, which is condition 12? Um, there are an additional 60 parking spaces um, allocated. How many of those will be electric charging? How many electric charging points will there be within that? Um, do we have a standard formulation as to how many we should have? I couldn't see anything in the report. Amended wording condition 12 requires before the occupation of the development one electri electric vehicle re recharging point should be provided and a specifications first agreed in writing. So that requi requires one electronic vehicle charging point. Would that be the normal number for... 60 uh, for, a, for a space of 60 um, car parking spaces. I did think it was more than that. That's, that's the only reason I'm asking the, uh, the, the question. I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head, but if you wanted that condition amending, we could reword it to say that we would require a scheme and then look for them to provide as many as possible and have dialogue around that if some if that's something that members were wanting i don't see an issue around that we can ask for a scheme and then work that through with officers once it comes to that point thank you i'd, I'd be happy with that I, I would i just recall that previous schemes have involved more electric um, okay. vehicle charging points thank you i'm sure we'll pick that up uh, councillor douglas on the electric uh, charging points as well, I understand that the technology around this is developing rapidly and we've, we're going to future-proof buildings. Then is there any way that we can feed in condition about the type of technology that needs to be implemented on that? We can cover that through the wording of the scheme because it may be that it all depends. We can we can cover that through. I'll re, I can reword that condition and ag agree it with the chair if you're okay with that. To look at how exactly how we word that to make it more fit for the purpose that you want it. Thank you. That'd be fine. Any more questions of the officer, Councillor Waters, and again Councillor Pavlovic. <clears throat> well, bearing in mind what officers have said in paragraphs 3.5, 3.7 and 3.8 about views of the building, why is it being deemed acceptable to have an alternate light grey and dark grey building instead of insisting on something that was dark green so that you wouldn't have the concerns over those views, especially in winter? Because it's an industrial building, and industrial buildings by the nature are usually this, the grey in colour. There's other similar buildings in the locality. Given that, the balance that we've made is that that was acceptable. It's also part of a wider allocation, so you would expect that other industrial type buildings would come forward. Hence why we've got to the point of saying this is acceptable. If members 
think otherwise, and that's that's entirely up to you. But that's the reasoning why we've got to where we have got to. Thank you. We can pick this up in, in the debate. Yeah, Councillor Pelvic. Can I ask you about the newts um, and newt legislation? Um, paragraph 3.21, um, the great crested newts. What is the exact situation and what is the likely impact of this development on them and their breeding? I see the condition um, that we've incorporated um, in condition 20. But I just wondered if you could give us, um, for those of us that weren't able to be there, um, the breeding pond and its vicinity to the site. Really sorry, I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. I, I wouldn't want to say that I do because I don't, sorry. Is that a question we could ask of the applicant? Well, we have yeah. Councillor Kilbane. Just for clarification, really, does the landscaping that's proposed replace the seven trees that are being lost? Rather than rifling through this, I would imagine, sir, because that was something that we would usually cover. Let me, I'll just check the conditions for you. suggest that if we can't answer that immediately yeah. we might return yeah. to that or just make sure that we're picking it up in the, in the debate. Are there any other questions? We do have a, 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 a speaker, um, uh, Catherine Dukes, who is speaking in support as agent for the applicant. Just press the microphone button and when you're ready, as you are aware, three minutes. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. Um, here on behalf of Sheffield International, William Birch and Sons, who are the joint applicants, the proposal involves the erection of a 33,000 square foot building intended to provide new premises for Sheffield International on land currently owned by William Birch and Sons. Following my presentation to planning committee last July, many of you will be aware of how Sheppey have been based in York for over 100 years. The company has evolved and today specialises in the production of machinery associated with the manufacture of glass containers, including bottles. It is a highly skilled business that provides a wide range of job opportunities, whereby the products they develop and manufacture in York have a place in the global market. Over 90% of their products are exported, whilst 85% of the parts they use in their manufacturing are sourced from within the UK. With increasing demands for glass containers due to, part, in part, the negative media coverage of plastic bottles and packaging, Sheppey has an opportunity to further develop the business, which is likely to result in a 10% increase in the number of employees over the next five years. However, their present facilities at Elvington Airfield Business Park are acting as a constraint on their business, especially as their operations are currently split, split across five buildings that are highly inefficient. It is therefore important that they secure new premises. As a result of their business expansion needs and wish to remain in York in order to retain their present skilled workforce, who are predominantly residents of York, discussions with William Birch and Sons, Sheppey's current landlord, led to the proposal in front of you. Elvington Airfield Business Park is one of only three key strategic employment sites identified in the emerging draft local plan. As such, development of the application site is in principle supported by the Council. However, the site is currently still considered to be within the general extent of the Green Belt until the local plan has been adopted, and so we've had to demonstrate very special circumstances. To this end, the significance of the Sheppey, of Sheppey to York economy has warranted the support of Make It York, who have submitted a letter detailing the economic benefits of the proposal to the York economy. In support of the support of officers and acceptance that very special circumstances have been demonstrated is explicit in the report that has been presented to members for consideration today. It should be noted that constructing the proposed building will in turn make available for other businesses five units at Elvington Airfield Business Park. Sheppey's move will therefore help address the extremely limited supply of premises within York. 
In terms of the material planning considerations, the proposal has been subject to extensive consultation and has been found to be acceptable. Of particular interest to members will be how a scheme of landscaping is proposed that will establish additional hedgerow tree planting to enhance local habitats and screen the building from wider vantage points. It, is also, it also establishes planting in advance of confirmation of the local plan allocation. Also, the proposal includes cycle parking and changing rooms for staff, something that current, the current buildings do not offer. Electric charging points are also to be provided. Almost time. On balance, the benefits of delivering a new building for Sheppey have been found to outweigh any potential harm, and so we would kindly ask that the application is approved today. Thank you very much. Are there any questions that you would like to put to the agent of the applicant, Council Waters? Um, I'm glad you mentioned uh, and you recognise the benefits of screening um, the scheme with landscaping. Would you agree that it would be a lot easier to um, mitigate against its impact if it was a green building, dark green clad, rather than what is currently proposed in front of us? Interestingly enough, we did have a discussion about the colour of the building, um, but as the officer mentioned, this is part of what is going to be a greater large-scale industrial estate. Um, so it's just a case, if it is what it is. And so what we've done is, with the screening, we've actually put additional hedgerows around the edges of the site. And also there's trees proposed to help break it up. Um, but it is that what we want is a feeling and, and um, an identity to the business park. So it's about setting off this as phase one, it'll expand and ending up with something that collectively looks, has an identity, just as the, the existing park does. But if screening is so important, wouldn't it be nice to have that identity, to have it blending in with the surroundings, rather than making a statement, which is what you're after with light and dark grey cladding, instead of green? I don't think the colour particularly... There's a, there's a palette, isn't there, for industrial parks? If you go to any of them around York, they all tend to be shades of grey, so it's just it's what's typical. So it, I don't think it would make a huge difference if the outside, those outside walls were painted green. Okay, thank you, thank you. Councillor Eyre? Okay. Are you wanting to... Please do. Thank you. Um, in respect of the hedgerow, um, 80 metres of um, species-rich um, hedgerow is going to be removed and is going to be replaced by, admittedly, uh, you're replacing it with more hedgerow. But can you tell me how long you feel that it will take to establish um, that? Because there's going to be a significant impact on the ecology um, and the wildlife that are able to um, that are going to have to be relocated. Um, it's a shame. Is there no way of, 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 of keeping some of that existing hedgerow? That hedgerow needs to be removed to be able to get the building and the car parking in. So what we've done is then provided hedgerows where we can through the site. Um, as, as the, there is actually a landscape plan that's, that's rather helpful, but it doesn't seem... It, yes. Um, but, I mean, if you think about the con what's involved in construction, it tends to be that you end up with a fence all the way around and all the construction goes on and then the fences come down and people start in habits. And so there will be that disruption, but ecology and the wildlife will work around it and then start to come back into site once it's all settled down because just the noise and disruption tends to, to you know, they, they will avoid, won't they, the area. But um, in terms of a hedgerow, depending on the site and the, and the species of what's put in, what you'll find is actually, even when you put a slight, an immature hedge in, you have to space the plants. Um, this, it depends on what species go in, but this is, there's different variation, different standards for spacings. But what you find is actually the plants are close enough together to allow the wildlife to... It, it isn't that you end up with hedges so far apart they can't transfer and walk between and hop and fly. It, it's, they're within a reasonable distance, so there should be something that creates the corridors from day one. And so will there be similar types of hedgerow to the hedgerow that's coming out? 
think that's what's proposed. It is all on the landscape plan. Um, the, the landscape officer and the case officer, in consultation with ecologists, they've all been rather keen on looking at the species already, and we've actually put in a very detailed landscape plan. So that level of detail might normally be conditioned uh, and subject to approval, but actually we've put the landscape plan in as part of it, just to make clear, clear how the ecology and the species would actually work together in this instance. Thank you. Any other questions? This might be an opportune time. If there are no other questions, thank you very much. We were wanting to have an answer to the question about trees a moment ago, and I think you've, you've, you've got an answer now. Thank you. Apologies for this plan, but it's probably easier to show you on here. So this is, this is a landscaping plan that we just mentioned. The hedgerow to be removed is this here, along with these trees here. Sorry, I'm talking to the mic. And then the new hedgerow and the new trees are all along here and along here. I'm going to have to scroll down. All the way along here. So all the way down there, around the building, and along here. So if my adding up is correct, there's 27 new trees proposed as part of the proposals. But that's just, again, apologies for the plan, but that's just to show where, you, where the removal is from. That also shows the other existing trees that are going to be protected down here as part of the proposals. And the significant amount of new planting in terms of the hedgerows and the trees that will take place here and down at the bottom where you can't see. Okay. <laughs> you have a further question? No. Councillor Waters? I thought we were going into debate. <laughs> You're just making sure you got in first. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Eyre. Yeah, one slightly odd one. At the bottom of page 85 and the top of page 86, it says that the former seeks to take the site out of the green belt as a strategic employment allocation, and the latter is a... I just wondered if you could solve the riddle. Appropriate term. <laughs> we, could, we could have a raffle and everything. <laughs> it's okay. No problem. Okay, the second Sorry, one something's a... happened with the formatting, I'm not sure. Sorry. Uh, the second one was around that issue of colour. If I understand from my reading of the paper that the local plan will set this out as an industrial area, if, for example, we were to suggest that this had to be green and that site was then included in the local plan and nothing else within that development would be bound by that same thing. So you would end up with an industrial estate that's primarily industrial with an odd green building sat as part of it. Is, am I, is that how I... Potentially. Potentially that's the case. I mean, it would dep depend on how big the scheme is, whether it then had to come back to this committee and whether or not you felt that you wanted to keep that going in the future. But... Yes, potentially. But given allocations in industrial given estate, in the committee would struggle then for yes. any future development in that area to insist that it had to be green. So That's we, how officers have got to the recommendation that we have in terms of weighing up the balance of it's a, going to be an industrial allocation. It's a standard industrial building, hence the recommendation that it's okay now. With the significant amount of landscaping that there is. Thank you. Is that the last of the questions? Councillor Pelvic. Can I just ask? why this is an approval in principle and it has to go to the Secretary of State? The size of the building. This is on something of a larger scale than the two previous applications. Uh, so, Councillor Douglas. Um, on the colour issue, if, if you go to other parts of the country, and I'm thinking particularly in the West Country, they tend to have um, either green buildings or a gradation of colour, so it starts at green at the bottom and will change through blue to grey to white, so it uh, blends in with the, the landscape. 
And just because around York everything looks grey and industrial, it doesn't mean that we necessarily need to carry on in this way. And uh, I, I just don't think that, you know, as you say, that uh, if you put one building on a site that is a certain colour, then it restricts the rest. I mean, that's what we're doing with grey, isn't it? So I don't think that argument really comes into consideration. I think the better argument is that we should be thinking about our environment and trying to blend our buildings into the background rather than sticking out like a sore thumb. Thank, thank you for that. I think that with that, effectively, we've moved in to debate rather than questions. Um, so I'm just checking there aren't any more questions. I think he's just trying to get in at the beginning of the debate, is that right? Okay, then let's, let's uh, now move into the debate. And uh, you're very keen. Well, <laughs> the waters. it's a business that needs support. So I'm quite happy to move the recommendation, providing we have a green building. It's on the periphery, it's against the landscape setting. Why try and fight it colour-wise? You've got it there in paragraph 3.5, 3.7 and 3.8. The large scale and light colour of the sheet metal clad units render them easy to identify, particularly in the winter landscape. I thought we are trying to blend them in with their landscape. The idea that because it's an industrial estate, even though it's on the periphery in an agricultural setting, that we somehow keep it grey is just ludicrous to me. So I'm quite happy to move it, the recommendation providing it's a green clad building. And we did have a similar thing a few months ago in relation to um, the battery units at Osborwick Merton, when we insisted on those being dark green to protect the views and the landscape. And it's a similar thing with this. Thank you for that. Can I suggest before we, you've, you've moved acceptance but with the proviso. So shall we just debate that for a, for a moment because Councillor Douglas was making I think a very similar point. Um, it may be that other members want to say something. Councillor de Goyne? Yes, I, I mean I don't think um, you can have make hard and fast rules and obviously we do employ planning officers to give us recommendations about the, given the particular context and circumstances and what we've been told is this has been um, the, the sort of design has been deemed as appropriate for a business part which potentially in the future this is what this is going to become um, I personally think that you know something that's a solid dark green might look wonderful in summer but then in winter it sticks out like a sore thumb um, and particularly in the landscape that we have around York, it's very flat and open, which is what we're talking about, green belt. Um, but depending on the, the, the weather at the time, um, the skies might be grey or bright blue. Um, they're not going to be green if that's what it's been seen against, a grey or something fairly neutral and uh, sort of inoffensive as possible is what we're looking for, not, ne not necessarily something that looks like um, a large green bl block on the landscape. Thank, thank you. Uh, Councillor Webb and then Councillor Fitzpatrick. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, th I think I'd say that one dark green building is, is going to be as much of a, an eyesore. The, 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 the the thing that's maybe a blight on the landscape is the fact that we've got a whopping great big building being built. There's, there's no way around that. I, I agree with the building the building because it will bring jobs to York. It's a good thing. Um, my worry is that if you have one dark green building, then when we come to future expansion of this site, we might end up with four or five dark green buildings, which everyone who works there has got to wander about in the dark forever. Um, and I think it will begin to look quite unsightly. I, I would support, I think, what Councillor Douglas said about potentially a gradation, sort of a, just trying to blend it in a bit better. But I think, yeah, sort of a solid green building ain't going to look any better. And I would much rather just we move as it is, if it is easier. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, well, certainly I like what uh, Councillor Douglas has said, but I would want it to be green in some shape or form, and I'm slightly amused, um, Councillor de Gaulle, that you don't want um, it to be green in any shape or form, actually. But, uh, yeah, it just grey, I just think, is, is, is not appropriate. Thank you. Th uh, Councillor Fenton. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think we're looking at the application as it stands. We could have a very long and quite interesting debate about <laughs> different gradations of buildings. Um, Councillor Douglas mentioned the South West. You're probably thinking about the Morrison's Depot on, off the motorway, but which is a, a very, very, very interesting example of um, how to make a green building look interesting and blend in with the landscape. Um, but I, I, have, I have no issue with, with the colour palette that's being proposed. I think there perhaps is a, um, a wider debate to be had, maybe when, a, when an industrial site is being created from, from scratch, as to exactly what you want the look and feel of that to be. Um, but this is a, a building that's being added to a, a collection of existing buildings, and, and it probably isn't the, the best place to have that debate, so I'm kind of happy to support it as it, as it stands. Councillor Ayer. Thank you, Chair. I'm not particularly wedded to any colour, and I think there are pros and cons of any particular colour we pick. I think the fact that Councillor de Gorn did go against green was almost enough just to convince me in, in itself as a, as a comment. Uh, the, as I said before, my, my primary concern is that because this is currently an application in the green belt, we do have an opportunity to put control on this building. However, as none of these comments were made during the local plan process, none of that is in the local plan policy. So as a planning committee, when those applications come on, we wouldn't have any control over what the colour of those were. So I think if we were able to do it as a whole, for the whole site, then I would probably be more supportive of that debate. But I think we were in danger of just creating a little ad hoc thing that this building gets sort of manipulated by committee, and then the rest of the site is just develops piecemeal, and I think that would, would be a shame. Thank you. Councillor Dobney. Without going over again what other members have already said, um, I would suggest that since the landscape and the sky particularly changes colour throughout the year, we be on the safer ground uh, insisting on good screening of the, of the site uh, rather than trying to choose a particular colour. Because one part of the year that colour will stand like, like a sore thumb and at other times of the year it will blend away but also covered by the trees. So I suspect that the landscaping is probably more important than, than the colour. Thank you for all of those contributions. Um, of all the things that we could be picking up with this, it seems the one thing we're picking up is the, is the, the, the colour. Uh, um, uh, and of course the, the application is very specific with the, the, uh, the round numbers of uh, the, the panels of this building. Can you just advise us, if we wanted to, 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 uh, to develop this in, in some way, how would we do that without um, running into difficulties? I mean, if members decided that they did want to change the colours, they can do that. We'd have to specifically word a condition that said notwithstanding the details submitted to ensure that we went away from, because as Councillor Colwick quite rightly just said, the, the application is very specific to the colours that they're proposing, the greys, and we've, as officers, we've assessed it, we've looked at it, we think it's consi considered acceptable given its location, given the considerable landscaping that's proposed, but again, if members wanted to change that, we could word a condition that said notwithstanding the details submitted as part of the application. And the, the, if I might, uh, Chair, the only thing I would add to that is that it's important that we have clarity um, as with all planning conditions, that's the rule, so we've got to have something that is pre as precise as possible. Just on that point, yeah, we, and just to take stock of where we are again, if I may, Chair, we've got um, a proposal from Councillor Waters, which is in effect an amendment to, uh, to, to approve subject to a, a particular condition um, that hasn't been seconded yet. Um, so I just made that point. So you have approved that, Councillor Waters. 
Well, I just wanted to add, after listening to the debate, that what is proposed will stand out 12 months in the year. And bearing in mind what Councillor Dagon said about his concerns about dark green in winter, that will probably only stand out, if I was to accept it, was going to stand out for five months in the year. So it's just one thing to bear in mind. Can I at this point then ask for a seconder to the motion that this is approved, subject to, and we will then need to be very specific about the detail of the colour and conditions related to that. I don't see a seconder for that. Okay. Councillor Rapp. In which chair can I move the recommendations as written by officers? So, uh, that is proposed. It is seconded by Councillor Pavlovic. Vote on that. I'd just like to observe, I find it somewhat bizarre that we have a long discussion about what colour it is, but not whether it's got solar panels or adequate insulation to reduce the energy use of this building. I, I do note uh, paragraph 5.3 that says it doesn't meet BRIAM excellent. Um, I think that this is, I would hope, be something that we'd be giving increasing in attention to. I recognise we are constrained by whatever we have specified in our local plan, but certainly if this is the first of a number of buildings that are going to go onto this site, it would be far more iconic to have something that's got rainwater harvesting and solar panels to demonstrate commitment to sustainability. And worry about what colour it is. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I don't think it would be fair to try and penalise a, a company by insisting on BRIAM excellent for what is in effect an industrial unit. Um, I think you know, be, we should be encouraging this sort of thing. Um, and BRIAM very good is hard to achieve. Excellent is expensive and it may be obstructive to other companies coming forward wishing to develop on the same site. Councillor Eyre. Thank you, Chair. I was moving on with the, the proposing, so I didn't have a chance to say anything at that point. Just to echo my support for this, this application, I think it's very clear that there are very special circumstances. Uh, a company that's been with us for almost, well, I think, over a century. Uh, I'm in a mischievous mood, so I will just draw the attention of the committee to paragraph 1.3. I think just to wish the company luck in the future, as 90% of the business that they do is traded primarily with Europe as we go forward. And I do note that that is in the, uh, the supply of wine and beer industry materials, which I'm sure many of the Conservative candidates are currently quaffing while trying to shut off those access to those business routes. Uh, not convinced as a material consideration, <laughs> but thank you for your contribution there. <laughs> Um, I think we are moving close to the point where, where we have a vote, so let's be clear. There are amended conditions as detailed in the officer update. Uh, one, uh, planting for the lifetime of the development. We touched on that earlier. And two, condition 12 with regard to electric, electric vehicle recharging scheme, which we picked up earlier. So um, with those amendments, are we at a point where we could move to the vote? It has been seconded. Um, so therefore, I invite you to indicate uh, approval for this application. Any against? That's one. I take it no abstentions. Thank you very much. With that, we have concluded the three items, um, but we still have on our agenda this evening the uh, item number five. page 101, which is the appeals performance and decision summaries, and maybe you could just yeah, introduce this for us and uh, yep. why it is that this committee is, is looking at this at this point. What does it yes. mean for us? No, it's just, so it's just a short report basically about the appeals and performance and decision, decision summaries. It's for members to note and ask any questions if they 
want to ask any questions, but it just basically shows table one and table two are the percentages that are more important, most probably important to draw your attention to. But it's for members to know. Okay. Thank you. And just a, a comment. I mean, how do we do? You have some idea how we compare with other yeah. authorities or with our own past history? These, these are pretty standard, I'd say, in terms of the allowed ones. The obviously the table two is 26% for the 12-month appeal. 26 is actually quite good. I think the national average is around about 32. I think. Don't quote me on that, it's just off the top of my head. So, yeah, in terms of the performance, we're doing as well as we should in terms of that. Councillor Ayer. Thank you, Chair. I just think in light of the, the start of the meeting and some of the comments that were made, I think this is clear indication of the hard work and dedication that does go on in terms of the staff we have at this planning committee, and I think that should be recognised by all members. Uh, thank you for that. I'm sure that comment is appreciated by by officers um, who, of course, have no right of reply. Um, but uh, on the other hand, I think it's also important that members of the public have the opportunity to have their say. And you will have heard me say earlier that there is uh, an opportunity for uh, uh, agents to uh, attend an agents forum, something which was started in about a year ago. I think it, um, it actually meets three times a year and is meeting again very shortly and does provide an opportunity for that kind of conversation. Do you want to? Please do. And then I realise we've got another question. But Sorry. Do. It's just worth me um, explaining the agents forum that we've set, well, recently set up. We've had first of the meet. We're having, intending on having three meetings a year with regular agents where there's myself and a coordinator from the agent that meet agents that meet twice a year. And then once a year, we're proposing to meet all the agents that regularly submit and open the dialogue in a positive and constructive way. So that's something that we've recently set up. And again, they can engage with us and again, we can engage with them and become more proactive and positive. So we've had the first of those in February. The next one is scheduled for next Thursday and then the one with all the agents will be in October this year. All the minutes are sent out to any interested parties. So it's all about engaging and, and having that positive dialogue. So we have set that up recently. Okay. That's, that's excellent and very, very helpful. And to remind members, of course, that councillors can call in anything during the consultation period. I think it was Councillor Webb, yes. Hi, uh, yeah, it's something very simple, and probably because I'm quite new to this. It's just a question, really. Obviously, there's been uh, 21 uh, appeals. Um, how, what is that as in terms of percentage of the total number of applications? I know that this is spoken specifically on appeals, but sort of over the last, that quarter, you know, how many applications sort of were there? That's a, good, that's a good question. I don't know exactly how many were in that quarter. I would say there would be round, if you look at how many applications we receive in a year, it'd be about 500 to 600, maybe a quarter. So not a big proportion that have been refused an appeal. So yeah, I think that's an excellent indication of what officers did, are doing really. You know, it helps us a lot. Again, thank you for that comment. Councillor Waters. Just in relation to something that came up at uh, area planning last week, um, would you like to confirm about the award of costs in appeals and that it's very, very rare and it's only on occasion of what's deemed to be unreasonable behaviour by one of the parties? And in relation to what we've got in front of us today, I'm assuming there, are, there haven't been any costs awarded to anybody? Not that I'm aware of. But I'm, I can't think of any off the top of my head where we've had costs awarded. They are, it is quite rare. In term, it has to be unreasonable behaviour that there's something in there that the inspectorate find, and I'm not aware of any that we've, in these statistics, that we lost costs on. Thank you very much. I don't see anybody else indicating, so uh, as there are no urgent items of business, that draws us to the close of the meeting. Let me just say one thing. Go on, I'll let you. Thank you.
just an observation. Just Having been away from planning for four years, I do find it slightly, you know, just my heart sinks when I realise the acoustics in this room are so awful. And it reminds me of what it's like for members of the public to be sitting right back there and they can't hear a lot of the comments. Nobody's fault in the front row, but they just can't be heard. I don't know. We can't obviously do anything about it, but it, uh, it's stacked against members of the public, in my opinion, sometimes when they're sitting at the back and they can't be heard. And it's not always easy for us to hear around the table. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will draw the meeting to a close. I, I just want to briefly explain that uh, this committee has, certainly as far as, as long as I've been on it, be, you know, started at 4.30. Uh, today we started at 5 o'clock. That was simply because, uh, as you're probably aware, there had been uh, the possibility of a presentation from the Environment Agency at 4.30. Uh, to which all councillors would have been invited, but for a number of reasons that, that hasn't happened. Uh, but rather than then chopping and changing with the start time uh, of the meeting, it, it seemed sensible to stay with, with five o'clock, given that there wasn't likely to be a long agenda this evening. But I'm not anticipating uh, that that would continue to be the case, and I would expect, uh, unless I hear very strong voices to the contrary, that we would normally start at 4.30. Having said that, um, I declare the meeting closed. Thank you very much.